Hey there, it's Colin from A View From Earth, from the Fisk Planetarium. We are super stoked to announce that this is the first episode of season two. Hooray! Yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, I guess I should go ahead and say this is the A View From Earth podcast. And uh, what we do is we're looking to, to talk with Colorado-based scientists about the work that they're doing and kind of, uh, you know, bridge the gap between scientists and uh, the listener, you, on the podcast, whether you be a student at CU or someone who's just interested in what's going on here at the University of Colorado and uh, surrounding institutions. And so um, that's what we're here for. I, I mentioned my name is Colin. I'm a CU student. Uh, when the Fisk Planetarium is open, as far as like physically speaking, uh, then I would be presenting shows there as well. And uh, next to me here on Zoom is my co-host, Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi, Colin. Yeah, I'm Tara. I'm a CU alum. I'm a planetary scientist and also occasionally a presenter at FISC when I can. And I do the uh, out coordinate the outreach program there too. So I, I wear lots of FISC hats. And, uh, you know, I think that we, we it's appropriate to introduce our producer, John, who I think you may have only heard from in the last episode of season one. It's time to say hello to John uh, in this little intro thing. Hi, John. Hello. Yes. Uh, the uh, last time I was on the podcast, it was just a little post-credit uh, scene at the on the last episode of season one. I put that in there just because it was fun. Um, but yeah, this is my first time on the podcast proper. I'm a navigator at Fisk. Um, I'm also a full-blown production assistant. So I've been working on creating uh, media for the full dome uh, format, but this is a fun exploration of, you know, regular media. So, yeah. Well, John, what we do at the podcast would be completely impossible without you. So thanks very no, much thank for you. producing our show. Uh, we need so, all the help we can get. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You guys do just fine without me. So this week we are talking with somebody named Mike Scholl, uh, who is a professor and researcher here at the University of Colorado. And we're gonna be talking about something called missing matter. Yeah, air quotes there, finger quotes, missing matter. Um, and, and I guess the first question before we get started is, you know, what, what, are, what does that even mean? What are we looking at, Tara? Yeah, so it's a really, um, he's going to uh, probably explain this a lot better than me, but the general idea is that, you know, we, we can, there's different kinds of matter in the universe. There's regular matter, like the stuff we have on the periodic table, hydrogen and oxygen and stuff like that. But then there's also dark matter and dark energy, and these are all components of what makes up the universe. Um, and f through a couple different ways, we can kind of figure out how much of each of those we should expect. And the missing matter problem is essentially like, we know how much of that normal average baryonic matter we should expect, but we can't find all of it. Like using the technology we have, we've only found, I think like 70% of it so far. And so there's this, all this matter out there that we think should be there, but eh, where is it? We don't know. And this so, is, to be extra clear, this is not dark matter because there's a, that's kind of a buzzword, right? Ooh, it's this matter that does stuff and we can see that it's doing stuff, but we can't see it. This is not that. No. The missing matter that we're talking about is the same matter that you and I are made out of with protons and neutrons. And it does interact with light. That's like a, the big distinction between non-dark matter, AKA baryonic matter and right. dark matter, right? So this is not yeah. dark matter. There's, we're talking about normal matter, but it's just, we're not seeing as much as we should. Yeah, yeah, totally different things, which I was confused about when I was first like looking into this. I thought it was like dark, he was talking about dark matter, but no, yeah. apparently there's regular atoms and molecules that we just can't find. Yeah, yeah. I, there's one thing that uh, I, I foresee coming up, which is uh, something called spectroscopy. And I think it would be useful to know as a listener who is not already trained in what spectroscopy is to just know really quick, 
you know, what that means as we kind of go into this conversation. And Tara, I know you work with spectroscopy, so you can probably give a, 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 a clear uh, description of, of this process. Would you mind enlightening us about Not at all. Spectroscopy? That is what I do. That's like half of my job anyways. Um, basically, when, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this. So when you shine light at something, light gets reflected back. So like things that you, that you see with your eyes, I'm looking at my computer right now, that's because light is hitting it, bouncing off of it and hitting my eye. And my eye can interpret different colors and shapes and things like that. Well, each different atom and molecule and everything in the universe reflects that light a little bit differently. So spectroscopy allows us to take that light that we receive from whatever we shot it at, say I'm shooting light at my coffee mug here, and I can see it bounces back to me and my eyes interpret part of that light as the shape and the color and things like that, what it's made out of. We can also use the light that comes back to us at other wavelengths too, like in the infrared or ultraviolet or microwaves, radio waves, stuff like that. We can look at how the light bounces back to us and tell what kind of elements are in there based on how that light is reflected. That's the like 101 super oversimplified way to explain it. It's actually kind of black magic. <laughs> And it's super, I didn't realize this when I got into it, but it's way, way, way complicated because it can, the way that that light's reflected can change based on the temperature of the object, based on how far away it is, based on if it's wet or dry. That's a problem that I run into. So there's a lot of different things that can affect that, but that's a general idea is that every atom and molecule reflects light a little bit differently. And by looking at how that light gets reflected back to us, we can kind of tell what it's probably made out of. So like I can, I always tell people, I can look at a moon around Jupiter a billion miles away and tell you if it's grass or astroturf, you know? So things on that are- this, On this moon around Jupiter. This, yeah, yeah, totally yeah. grassy. 100%, that'd yeah, be but, cool. Although what would be cooler, I think, is if you saw AstroTurf, because that would imply that something made AstroTurf, and you'd say, wait, we didn't put that there, so how'd that AstroTurf get on that moon around Jupiter? I like that they call it AstroTurf. It would definitely, it would be real AstroTurf if it was on a moon. It really would. Would that make it Astro AstroTurf, or would it, we just call it AstroTurf? That's just redundant. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, anyways... <laughs> Anyways, so we can jump into our interview now. We recorded this a little bit earlier. So uh, again, we're talking with Dr. Mike Scholl. We'll give you a quick introduction on him. Uh, but you guys enjoy. So today we are talking with Dr. Mike Scholl, who's a professor at, in the CU Astrophysics and Planetary Science Department, specializing in UV and X-ray observations of galaxies and their constituents and the spaces in between them. He works to understand the early days of stars and galaxy formation and how they affect the distribution of matter in the universe, both then and now. He also uses the Hubble, <laughs> Hubble Space Telescope to look at the local environment of our own Milky Way galaxy. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Scholl. Glad to be with you. Excellent. So I thought we'd start with a pretty basic kind of question. Can you give us some kind of a quick overview of this missing matter problem? Yes. Well, first, we have to talk about what do we mean by matter. Uh, and as you and I discussed, a lot of people talk about dark matter, uh, which is also something that's missing. We don't know what it's made of. It's a very exotic form of, of matter that gravitates and holds stars and galaxies bound, bound to the Milky Way. But the missing matter problem that we've been looking at with Hubble has to do with just ordinary garden variety matter. It's called baryonic matter because it's made of protons and neutrons. But I like to talk about uh, stuff in the periodic table. Most people have heard of the periodic table. Turns out most of the matter, ordinary matter in the universe is in hydrogen and helium, the first two elements of the periodic table. Then everything else, uh, carbon, oxygen, iron, etc., makes up about another 2% uh, in, in the big scheme of things. So the missing matter problem of of ordinary matter is that we think we're pretty sure how much of that was made in the Big Bang back in the first 10 or 20 minutes of the universe. And we have, have good 
uh, good ways of measuring how much is out there. And for many decades, there was about a factor of five or six missing. And slowly over the last 10 years, I think we've, we've closed in on finding most of it. It's, it's out, in between, out in between the galaxies, out in the intergalactic space. And the way that we did that was telescopes in space using very, very large ultraviolet and X-ray spectroscopy, large telescopes to do the spectra. And the reason the UV and X-ray are so important or so, so valuable is that, that the intergalactic space is pretty much empty, but there's a lot of it. So it all adds up. <laughs> And so in order to see the very trace amounts of hydrogen and helium and these other elements out there is that we need to take spectra of distant quasars and look at absorption lines in the ultraviolet and x-ray and measure the accumulated amount of, of missing matter. Uh, and, and the good news is that we found most of it. I would say uh, at least 70% is accounted for of the missing matter that we think was made in the Big Bang. And the next decades, uh, there's still some more to do, is to find that other 30%. So I guess the first question that comes to mind uh, when we start talking about this is, you mentioned that, that you know, we're missing now today 30% of the matter that scientists predict was created in the Big Bang. How do scientists go about determining the amount of matter that there should be? that we should be able to observe. Right, right. Everyone always asks that fundamental question. How do you know for sure what, what's out there and, and what's missing? Um, going back 30 years, when people first started to see this problem, there was only one way of doing it. It was kind of an indirect way of measuring uh, the amount of deuterium out in space or in, in interstellar space relative to ordinary hydrogen. So deuterium is heavy hydrogen. Uh, it's, it's a nucleus with a proton and an extra neutron. And so uh, why is that important? How does that tell us how much the Big Bang made? Well, it's called Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The hot Big Bang cooked together in the, in the beginning, cooked together all the protons and neutrons and, and made them into helium. So out of the Big Bang came hydrogen and helium and just a little bit of deuterium left over kind of like ingredients left over from a cake after you take it out of the oven. And so by measuring the amount of deuterium left over from the Big Bang, uh, it's a very, very, uh, very, very strong probe of how much matter was out there. And, and in, in simple words, the more, the more baryons there were, the more, the more the cake got cooked and more of the hydrogen got cooked into helium. So if you have any deuterium left over, that tells you that the Big Bang uh, was not that baryon rich. And that's what we found. We found that only about, only about uh, 5% of the total matter and energy of the universe, only about 5%, 4.6% to be precise, was uh, in ordinary matter. If there had been 10% or 20%, we wouldn't see any deuterium. There wouldn't be any heavy water. There wouldn't be any, any deuterium. And the amount of helium would differ. So this Big Bang nucleosynthesis was a really, really good probe of the baryon density. Well, you don't like to have just one way of, of measurement in science. You always like to check it, come back and check another way from a different, a different way of doing it. And that way came a little over 15 years ago with the microwave background. And I, it's probably closer to 20 years now. The COBE experiment, uh, Cosmic Background Explorer that NASA launched in the 90s. And then following it up, um, the WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave Explorer. And finally, the Planck mission between Europe and, and the United States, ESA and NASA. Those three experiments have zoomed in on the microwave background and using basically sound waves that show up in, in the hot and cold spots of the microwave emission, those sound waves tell us 
that also about four and a half, four point six percent of the matter is in baryons. So now we have two different ways. We have big bang nucleosynthesis, deuterium, and we have the sound waves in the cosmic microwave background that also give the same answer. And they agree to within just a few percent. So we're pretty happy that two independent ways told us that the universe is made of about four and a half, 4.6 percent baryons and about 25 percent dark matter, exotic stuff, and about close to uh, 79, 78, 79 percent dark energy, which is a whole other subject. This is something that we don't understand, but it's, it's causing the universe to accelerate. So we now, we now have the ingredients of the universe. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to round off 4.6%. It's about 5%. So 5% baryons, 25% dark matter, and 70%, something like 70% dark energy. I think I may have misspoken a minute ago. I said 70 something, but 68, 69, 70% dark energy. Okay, so now we have our hunting license. Let's go find those 5% of baryons. And, and that's quick, the baryon. Can we just define baryon? I, you may have done yeah. this at the very beginning, but just to be super clear. Right, let's go back and say it again. Baryons uh, are a term that particle physicists adopted going back um, 80 years. A baryon comes from the, the Greek word baryos, meaning heavy. And it's, it's ordinary heavy matter made of protons and neutrons. And there's some exotic particles that you can create in atom smashers that also are baryons, but, but they're evanescent. They decay quickly back to protons and neutrons. So anything with a proton or a neutron in it is a baryon. So any atomic nucleus in the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, uh, carbon, oxygen, on up the periodic table. They're all made of nuclei with protons and neutrons in them. And that's the ordinary garden variety matter called baryons. And I think I also said it, but out in space, most of the baryons are hydrogen and helium. So did we, did we cover the technology enough? You know, I think Tara in her questions asked me, what was the breakthrough? Because for years, this was uh, pretty theoretical stuff. You know, where's the missing matter? Could it be out in uh, interstellar space? Could it be out in the halo of the Milky Way? Uh, are you sure that it's made of protons and neutrons? When I was in grad school, some, some people jokingly said, well, you know, there could be interstellar basketballs floating around. And then other people said, well, maybe it's, it's mini black holes, et cetera. It, it's come down to something pretty mundane, which is it's gas. It's interstellar and intergalactic gas in the halo of galaxies, not just the Milky Way, but other halos. And then more exciting to me, it's out in intergalactic space, left over from when galaxies were formed. Uh, so that's how I got interested. Are we sure that, that when galaxies started forming out of the intergalactic plasma left over from the Big Bang, how much got, got collapsed into galaxies like our own and how much was left over in between galaxies. Okay, so yeah, all this gas is out there in interstellar space. So we're finding most of it. You said about 70% of the missing matter we've found now. I, th I think, you know, 70 plus or minus, I figure what, what we said in our 2012 paper, 70 plus or minus 10%. It, it's, uh, it comes in different forms, different phases, we call it. Uh, what's a phase? Well, hot and cold gas. If a gas is, is cold, it tends to be in a different state of matter, different state of ionization, basically, than if it gets really hot. And uh, so a lot of it is, is, we call it in quotes, cold. It's anywhere from 3,000 to maybe 20,000 degrees Kelvin or centigrade. Pretty hot stuff, but we call it cold because an awful lot of it we're finding or we found with our telescopes is up at 100,000 or even several million degrees. Uh, it's been shock heated by all the processes that form galaxies. When the matter is falling into the Milky Way or falling into other galaxies, it gets shock heated to millions of degrees. And then it can cool. Uh, as the universe expands, it also cools. 
So what we had to do, it was a, a very long process taking a good part of a decade. We had to develop theoretical models and how galaxies form and how the structures between the galaxies form, something we call the cosmic web. Uh, it's a filamentary structure of dark matter and baryonic matter that connects the galaxies. Um, it, it's, it's very, uh, very beautiful pictures that the computer models make of a cosmic web. And then we had to start looking for it using ultraviolet spectra with Hubble, uh, or before that with the far ultraviolet spectroscopic explorer views. So these, these telescopes that NASA launched in the 90s, uh, Fuse and then Hubble, and then uh, Chandra and the X-ray, these UV and X-ray telescopes really um, gradually filled in the background of, of what does this cosmic web look like and then how much of it is there. And what's keeping us from finding that last 30%? Do we need like new technology or just more time and energy or? Well, I'd say a little bit of both. Um, you, you don't get all the time you want on these telescopes. Hubble is oversubscribed eight to one. So, you know, what does that mean? It means you write a great proposal, you think, oh, this is sure to win, and only one in eight win. So it, it's taken a good part of 10 years to accumulate the data in the ultraviolet. Uh, and we're, we're not the only ones doing it. There's groups from, from Wisconsin and uh, California and, and around the world actually now, it's really caught on to be quite the cottage industry to go and look for this missing matter in galaxies and intergalactic space. So in over 10 years, 10 or 12 years, 10 or 12 cycles of Hubble, I think we've come to a point where, um, you know, we're, we're just filling in the error bars, making the error bars smaller. There's still some questions about the thermal phase. Uh, how much, let's say of oxygen, is five times ionized and how much is six and seven times ionized. That's a very technical issue that we argue about um, at meetings. Uh, to get to the oxygen ionization problem, it, that brings in the X-ray telescopes, Chandra and uh, XMM Newton, which are US and ESA missions, which are still going also. But there again, uh, the amount of observing time is limited. It's, it's, it's really hard to get enough time. Literally a million seconds, that's, that's uh, a month of observing time in order to just get one target. The paper that we wrote back in 2018 that got a lot of publicity. I don't think we advertised it enough, but it was, it was a heroic effort to get a million, a megasecond observation or two. Uh, so yes, um, <clears throat> I think a technological breakthrough is needed there <clears throat> because it shouldn't take a million seconds. If we had a bigger telescope with a better spectroscopic instrument on board. And so now to come back to Hubble, that's what happened with Hubble. We built at the University of Colorado in collaboration with NASA and Johns Hopkins and Berkeley, we built, built the cosmic origin spectrograph. And Jim Green, another professor at CU, was the principal investigator. He came up with a better way of getting more throughput at, at higher spectral resolution in the ultraviolet. And that was the breakthrough. Now everyone wants to use COS, COS, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. It's become the workhorse, workhorse spectrograph on Hubble. And it's because of a better technology of, of optics and uh, building great, using gratings in the ultraviolet with a higher throughput. So instead of a million seconds, it only takes maybe a few thousand seconds, maybe 10,000 seconds. It's a factor of 100. So we need the equivalent breakthrough in the X-ray. And there are people working on this. They know how to do it now. They just need the opportunity, maybe in the next decade. Uh, we'll see what the decadal survey comes up with. But the designs are out there, both for the UV and for the X-ray, to increase, increase the throughput, bigger telescopes, and better gratings, better spectrographs. Uh, so just to digress for a minute, uh, the decadal survey is something NASA commissions every 10 years. Um, costs was something that was approved in a previous decadal survey, and it got blessed and, and approved by the National Academy, and off we went. Uh, there are 
there are two instruments that I would love to see go forward in the next 10, 15 years. One is the large UV optical infrared telescope, LUVOIR, L-U-V-O-I-R. Uh, it's roughly a, a 10 or 12 meter telescope in space diameter. Remember Hubble is 2.4 meters. So this would be you know, more than a factor of 10 bigger, uh, or well, in throughput, because the area goes as the diameter. And then there's an X-ray, similar large X-ray telescope that's been proposed with these new super duper spectrographs on that would allow us to probe much better. Um, so those two missions, I don't know which will get approved. There, there's also a, a far infrared mission and a planet finder mission. So there are these four great observatories being looked at right now. We should know the answer within, certainly within a year of which one is approved. I'd be happy if any of them would go first, just a matter of, of musical chairs, you know, who gets, to, who gets to dance and who gets to sit down and build their instrument. So I'm thinking, so, you know, we, we talk about uh, the, the, what a telescope can resolve, right? And how long you need to do that. You mentioned 1 million seconds is kind of the number now, although maybe that's going down, right? With, with more recent technologies. Are you looking, you and the, and the people doing similar work to yourself, are you guys looking for uh, a density of matter or are you looking, are you trying to, to count all of it? Because I'm thinking in my head as you were speaking, I was like, well, you know, some of this is, is incredibly far away, right? I mean, in, and I guess I'm, I might be out of touch with how powerful some of these telescopes are. Are you looking to, to catalog all of this matter or are you using some technique that allows you to look and see maybe the density or the amount of matter in one area and then you can extrapolate that and say, okay, well, if we see this much here, then that indicates that there's this much in all of these spots that are similar to this one. Yeah, you, you've raised a very fascinating question. The answer is both. Uh, <laughs> we want to do both. We, we, let's call it local and cumulative. We want to find the amount of matter localized to individual galaxies like the Milky Way. Uh, how much is our Milky Way made of? How, what, is, what is its mass? And by the way, uh, just to digress for a minute, that is also not known to about a factor of 50%. <laughs> What's the mass of the Milky Way? It's in rough terms, it's about a trillion solar masses. It's about a trillion times the mass of the sun, but it could be one and a half trillion or it could be uh, maybe a little bit less than a trillion. And in the, astronomy, and, that's pretty good, right? I mean, if you're well, only off by a factor of 50%, that's like, that's pretty nailed in. Well, you might think that. People joke about factors of, of five and 10, but we've, we've started to become, we are now living in an era of precision cosmology. When I, when I talked about the baryon density and the matter density, we're, we're getting those down to a few percent. Uh, we're measuring the Hubble constant now to two or three percent accuracy. There's no reason that we shouldn't be able to have the same standards. Well, maybe not two percent, but 10 percent accuracy on these other things. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to do that. And that's, that's you asked, someone asked, why did I get into the game? I'm trained as a physicist. We like to build experiments that we understand and can put error bars on. So we'd like to get the amount of matter in the Milky Way, not just the total matter, but the baryonic matter, correct. And then nearby galaxies, Andromeda and the Magellanic Clouds, and all the nearby galaxies. But with Hubble and Chandra and cosmological exploration of the universe, we're going out 10 or 12 billion light years. We're looking back 10 or 12 billion years in the past. And we're seeing how that matter evolves because if it really is out in intergalactic space in the beginning, after the Big Bang, and then slowly the dark matter started to clump together and pull in through gravity, pull in the ordinary matter. That's how we think our Milky Way formed. It, it pulled in through gravity, all the matter out in space. And some of it came in in dark matter, mini halos, and some of it came in in gas streams. We want to understand that. So to do that, now we've got to look at the cumulative amount of matter between us and a very distant quasar. So if we find a quasar with Hubble, and that's our background lighthouse, out at, oh, let's say 2 billion light years away, 
one or two billion, you know, that's, that's still pretty close because all the way back to the Big Bang is, is 13 or 14 billion light years. So we find this quasar and we look at it, we can in principle, because of the expanding universe, sort out how much matter is out near that quasar and then everything in between through the absorption lines. And, and I, I passed over quickly a key point. People say, well, isn't all, isn't all that matter kind of piled up in, in the spectrum? Well, because of the, the beauty of the Hubble expansion, uh, stuff near the quasar is expanding faster and it's farther away, it's at a different wavelength, the redshift. And so it's all kind of sorted out for us. Thank you, Hubble expansion. Uh, and so we're able to take spectra at different wavelengths from the optical down into the ultraviolet with, with Hubble and sort out how much of the matter is nearby localized to galaxies and how much is farther away and how much is out in, in between the galaxies. So this localization, uh, I'm, gonna give, I'm gonna give a shout out to my former graduate student and Tara, you'll like this. His name is Jason Tumlinson, T-U-M, Jason Close. Tumlinson. He got his PhD at CU and then went on to great things. He's now at the Space Telescope Science Institute. He and his group uh, used the cosmic origin spectrograph to look at a bunch of galaxies with quasars behind them. And uh, they found through this COS HALOS project, COS for the cosmic origin spectrograph and HALOS for galaxy HALOS, they found that an awful lot of matter, uh, oxygen in particular, and all the hydrogen and helium that goes with the oxygen is out in the halo of the Milky Way and all the other galaxies they looked at. I think they looked at about 40, 40 or 45 galaxies. Every one of them had these giant halos of matter, including um, five times ionized oxygen out in the halo. And so that is a whole new, whole new ball game to the missing matter problem or missing baryon problem. They're finding that an awful lot of it was originally down in stars in the Milky Way and other galaxies. And then because it's oxygen, it had to be made in stars and then blown into space through supernova explosions and then blown out of the inter interstellar medium of the Milky Way out into the halo. How far people always ask, um, probably close to a million light years, certainly 500,000 light years. So our halo is huge and it's been polluted with heavy elements from stars and, and then blown out into the halo. There's also matter falling into these galaxies from inter intergalactic space. And so uh, this is something I'm working on right at the very moment with a former CU undergrad, Jacob Moss, did his uh, honors thesis with us. And uh, we're, we're looking at the inter interface between the halo or the galactic winds that blew that matter out into the into intergalactic space and what's out in the intergalactic space. It's not a vacuum, it's got pressure, it's got, it's got some oomph to it. And so when the wind hits that intergalactic medium, what happens? What happens, we think, what we wrote in the paper is something like the heliopause, the solar wind terminating against the interstellar medium. So just, just as there's a solar termination shock, solar wind termination shock, we think there's a galactic wind termination. So our Milky Way had a wind, a very strong wind in the past. Other galaxies also had winds that blew this matter out into space. They should all have, have termination shocks, we call it a galactopause, just like the heliopause in our solar system. So that's a whole nother story that I could go on and talk about. It's, it's great fun to, uh, to speculate theoretically about what could be seen in the future. We haven't seen it yet. We, we've seen maybe some circumstantial evidence, but this is something that a future mission could go and look for is the, uh, the galactopause of our, of our Milky Way or the galactopause around other distant galaxies with winds. Very cool. So, so now, you know, I guess I'll, I'll kind of re-rail myself. We'll return to the missing matter question. 
of so you know we, there's this distinction between the current missing baryonic matter and then something called dark matter right is and, and you know we kind of talked about how it was it was uh, these advancements in technology that allowed uh, you know people like yourself studying what you study to find a, you know more and more of the missing baryonic matter right and so there you know we thought well yeah it's out there but we can't see it because of this limitation and then you you know pass that and now you can see it do you think that there is a similar limitation in finding what we're calling dark matter is it you know could it be that that there's some technological limitation that we uh, you know simply need to overcome before it reveals itself and then you know at that point would it be uh you know something that we would then call baryonic because we you know it's it's now oh it is normal we just couldn't see it because of this limitation or is it some other completely different ball game well physicists have been asking that question for about 50 40 50 years uh I started out in particle physics theory back in grad school and then moved to astrophysics. But, but uh, understanding the fundamental nature of particles is still very much a technological driven question. We've built the Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland with, with the Europeans taking the lead. Uh, they were looking for, among other things, some, some exotic particles that could be the dark matter. The, the technical word for it is supersymmetric lightest supersymmetric particle. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't found it. So part of, the, part of the answer may be technological. Maybe it's out there and they haven't figured out the right way to find it. It sure would help if we knew what the dark matter particle was or what, what is it. Uh, just to go back to summarize, in terms of closing the universe, which we think is 100% of all the matter and, matter and energy, 5% is baryons, 25% is this dark matter. So 5 plus 25, 30% of the universe is gravitating matter, and we know it's there, we can feel its gravity. It holds stars together in galaxies, and it holds galaxies together in clusters. And if you didn't have it, it would, it would, uh, they would fly apart. And again, uh, it's not just, not, not just the stars and and galaxies flying apart, there's an independent check on how much dark matter there is. Cos cosmological background explorer and Planck microwave background explorer have, uh, through the sound wave physics, figured out independently and gotten the same answer. So somewhere around 25% of the universe is this is the exotic dark matter. If it, if it were baryons, we have to throw out Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Something would be wrong with our understanding of how, how the Big Bang made all the, uh, the hydrogen and helium and deuterium. I don't, think, I don't think that's the answer. I think, you know, we understand nuclear physics pretty well now. Uh, there could be something we don't understand about particles, quite likely, or something we don't understand about gravity, because a lot of this evidence for dark matter you know, the rotation curves of spiral galaxies. How fast are stars moving in the halos of galaxies? Uh, that's, that's pretty firm observations of the Doppler shift of, uh, and velocities of, uh, of rotation of galaxies. But maybe uh, on a very large scale of hundreds of thousands of light years, maybe we don't understand gravity. Well, that's not unique to me suggesting. Lots of people have been looking at that, again, for 30, 40 years. Exotic forms of, of gravity, uh, non-Newtonian or non-Einsteinian gravity. So if you were going to have to propose that, that would have consequences too. And people have, some people have said, well, no, the consequences of fifth force or exotic modified gravity, modified Newtonian gravity, the consequences would have results that, that we can rule out. Um, not, that's not my specialty. I'm sort of a, a spectator in that field, but I trust the people that have done those observations and I don't think that's the answer. Um, so is it technology? Well, technology would certainly help on the particle physics, figuring out what it's made of. You know, we know what, what baryons are made of. They're made of protons and neutrons. And we understand nuclear physics pretty well. So we can say, we understand how the sound waves form in the Big Bang, and we understand how protons and neutrons fuse together 
to make deuterium and helium and heavy elements. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't think that's going to be the answer. But we, but we do have a problem, and the problem is dark matter. We, we don't know what it is. Dark energy, the accelerating universe, we don't understand. 95% of the mass energy of the universe, we don't know what it's made of. So that's the fundamental problem. Uh, I don't think ultraviolet and X-ray telescopes are going to solve that problem. I think there's an awful lot of good physics in the microwave background. So I'm a cheerleader for, for better, uh, better missions in that, that realm. And I think the particle physicists need uh, better accelerators. And I don't know if it's high energy, but, but uh, better data to pin down the particle, if it's a particle, that makes up this 25% of the universe. You said, okay, so we found like 70% of this missing baryonic matter. There's another 30% that we new telescopes in the next 10 or 20 years might might find. Right. Once we've found all of this missing matter, assume that's assuming that's what's gonna happen, what's what comes after that? Is there once we've found it, is there more work to be done regarding this matter? Or is it just time to move on to something else? Maybe well, people, to that dark matter want, problem. Yeah, well. People will always move on to other things. I think, uh, you know, ADHD is something that, that permeates an awful lot of my colleagues. I don't want to say I have it, but maybe I do. Who knows? Attention deficit. <laughs> I don't want to make fun of, of the disorder. But, you know, people who are, are anxious and, and uh, want to move on to new unsolved problems will do so. But there's still an awful lot of interesting problems to, to mop up, if you will. Even if we know what the dark matter is, and if we know for sure that we know the ordinary baryonic matter, the, the 5%, and what it's, what it's made of and where it's located, I think we need now to turn back to the problem that got me into it, which is how do galaxies form? And why do galaxies come in all the varieties, shapes, and sizes? We've got, we've got elliptical galaxies, and spiral galaxies, and dwarf galaxies, and uh, galaxies have halos that have little clumps in them. Not, not just clumps of gas, but clumps of dark matter. We haven't, we haven't been able to probe that yet. Uh, if dark matter turns out to annihilate, to be a particle that can decay, and decay into something we can see, like photons, then uh, we could image it. We could image it in the X-ray, perhaps, or gamma ray, and people are trying. So I want to cycle back to something that I didn't talk about on, on why or how we look at the dark matter, or not the dark matter, the baryonic matter. We, we look using absorption lines. We find a, a lighthouse in space, a quasar typically, and take a spectrum and look at the absorption lines in between us and the quasar. And people always say, well, why don't you just go out and look in emission? If that stuff's out there, like interstellar gas, why isn't it glowing? And if you look at, at nebula, interstellar gas, uh, the, you know, the Orion Nebula is glowing. It's, it's beautiful. You can map out where all the gas is. And in the radio, we have the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen, which radio telescopes map out in beautiful detail. You can see the hydrogen in emission. Why can't we do the same for this baryonic intergalactic matter? Well, the answer is it's very low density. And in order to, to glow, it has to be high enough density for the particles to collide. That's how it creates emission. You have to have enough density, local density of matter. And intergalactic space is just, it's not a vacuum, but it's very, very near a vacuum. But it's got enough, it's got enough density, especially in the halos of galaxies, these, these cos halos, that we should, with, with a better imager in the UV and X-ray, we should be able to see it glow. And some very smart, people are building instruments right now. There's one out, out at Caltech that Chris Martin and his colleagues are built, building, and they put it on the Keck telescope, and they're starting to just get the first hints of seeing some filaments of the cosmic web. It's early days yet, but in the UV, in the ultraviolet, we should be able to, to build an instrument that could see this stuff in the, quote, modern universe out to, uh, well, certainly beyond Andromeda, out to the local group and beyond. And we should be able to see it glowing in the UV or in the X-ray. 
So I think, I think that's a bit of technology uh, to see this cosmic web missing baryonic matter in emission. You know, there's nothing like a picture. Uh, the, the absorption lines are little core samples that we've, we've drilled holes out through intergalactic space toward the quasars. We need many, many more of these core samples, and we'll have them with the LUVAR large UV optical telescope, I hope, in the next 10 or 20 years. Maybe we'll have similar core samples in the X-ray, but, but I'd like to see a, a picture of this cosmic web and the filamentary cosmic web glowing in the UV. And, you know, I hope to live to see it. My, my family lives in the Vernites, so I have, I have great hopes that NASA will come through or, or Europe, or maybe they'll even better, they'll join forces, NASA and ESA will join forces and make this happen sooner than 20 years off. I think that's an interesting point to bring up about spectroscopy too. That's what I do, I do infrared stuff, but we always think of things glowing and emitting because they're really hot. And you said these are like millions of degrees in some cases, but it's still so diffuse that you don't get those emissions that you would expect from hot matter. That's exactly right. Or, or cold matter, as long as it can collide, collide with something. Uh, you know, the interstellar medium of our galaxy, we can see in, in rich detail in almost all wavelengths, optical, infrared, x-ray, ultraviolet. And it's because it's dense enough, just to put it in context, it, it's got on average maybe one particle per cubic centimeter. Whereas if you go out to intergalactic spot space, it's one particle, one proton per cubic meter. So, you know, spread your arms and picture a cube and there's one proton in there, one hydrogen atom. That's pretty, that's pretty low density. So we are getting uh, quite close to our time for this interview, but we always like to ask our, our guests, what uh, brought you to where you are today? Uh, how did you, you know, as young Mike Scholl end up here talking with us, telling us about this missing matter problem that you are an expert in. Um, and, and, you know, what, what did you encounter along the way that, that kind of shaped your path? Well, let's see. Let me go back to high school. I went to high school in suburban St. Louis, Kirkwood, and uh, we like to think of it as possibly the best public high school in the state. I had wonderful teachers in math and science and English and history. Um, but I really got hooked on math and science, went off to Caltech as an undergrad in the 70s and uh, decided on physics as a major. And I, I love general relativity and particle physics. Senior year, I had a, I had a class from Richard Feynman and Kip Thorne, uh, who later I, I brought back to give the Gamov lecture in Boulder a couple years ago. So, you know, they sent me off to grad school at Princeton where I fully intended to study general relativity and particle physics, and I did. But in my first year, uh, I took a, just on a lark, I took classes in astrophysics because they had some world famous astrophysicists there, Martin Schwarzschild and Lyman Spitzer. And that did it. it, it changed my career. So from years two, three, three and a half, I, I switched from particle physics to astrophysics, uh, worked with Lyman Spitzer, uh, both on theoretical work, but at the time he was he was selling to Congress and NASA selling the Hubble Space Telescope. And in my last year, 75, 1975, 76, he would go down to Washington DC and Congress along with John McCall and lobby to build Hubble. And so I was already working with him on some ultraviolet data with a different telescope called Copernicus. So I was kind of steeped in theoretical astrophysics and ultraviolet space astronomy from the get-go. And then uh, many years later, uh, when Hubble got launched, I was, I was ready to work on it. But even before that, there was an ultraviolet telescope called IUE, International Ultraviolet Telescope Explorer. International Ultraviolet Explorer. So from high school through college through grad school, and then I came to, to Boulder in fall of 1977 uh, at, at Jilla, and then what was then the physics and astrophysics department. I got working on, on uh, studies in the ultraviolet and theoretical work. And then I guess in the 1990s, when we started thinking about what we could do on Hubble, 
uh, Jim Green and I and some others around the, around the country cooked up the idea for the cosmic origin spectrograph, wrote a proposal, uh, it was accepted and, uh, and put on board in 2009, May 2009, the last servicing mission of Hubble. So really shifting to the intergalactic medium was, was a logical growth of, of thinking about what this fabulous ultraviolet spectra could do, not just for intergalactic matter, but for studying quasars and galaxies. So another sort of half of my work works on quasars and reionizing the universe, you know, their, their ultraviolet and x-ray emission. So I'd say half of my work right now is, is working on quasars. And it was because of technology that um, smart technologists and instrumentation people like Jim Green and Webster Cash, who's also a colleague at CU, did. The two of them really were the pioneers of, of Colorado's involvement, first with FUSE, uh, Webster Cash and Jim Green, and then with the cost. Uh, now the next generation is moving ahead, and Kevin France, who's in the APS department and last, and was also, he's also with CASA. Uh, he and his colleagues are, are cooking up new ideas for Louvoir. I'm trying to say that with a French accent, L-U-V-O-I-R, Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope, a, a 10 or 12 meter in space and a spectrograph to go with it. So that's the future in the 2030s, I hope. They're saying 2035. Um, I think I'm gonna to have to live to be 100 to see this thing, but we have good genes in our family. I think you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but also in the students and postdocs and young faculty. And it's, yeah, yeah. it's those folks who are now in their 30s and 40s, well, and the students in their 20s that will live to see this, just as I did, in my 20, early 20s, working with Lyman Spitzer. Sure. You know, little did I dream that we would later have this cost spectrograph, but, but you know, you have to get started somewhere and dream and, and get trained in, uh, in what you can do with something like that. Because it Absolutely. takes the dreams in order to make it happen. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all the time that we have. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Scholl. It was fascinating to talk to you. I'm, I meant to have a prop. <laughs> Beautiful. Very nice. This is, this is a image uh, of an exploding white dwarf, but I'm showing it because uh, this public book was written by Mark Voigt, who was also a PhD student with me back in 1990 at CU, and Megan Donahue, who is now married to Mark, and the two of them we're at Space Telescope Science Institute. They're now at Michigan State. And you know, the younger generation is now moving on and doing great things. Always yeah, good to yeah. hear. Yeah. All right, so once again, thanks to Dr. Mike Scholl for joining us today and telling us all about weird missing matter and all the cool stuff that goes along with that. Thank you all to listening with us again today. We're super stoked to bring you season two, so we're glad to have you here. Definitely come back next week. We're gonna be talking to Dr. Carolyn Crow, who is a geochemist, technically an astrogeochemist. She studies moon rocks. <laughs> basically. So we're going to be talking about moon rocks and Martian meteorites and some of the cool stuff that we can learn from those. And we also want you to in, want to invite you to visit our website www.colorado.edu/fisk. There you can see our full season 2 lineup, all of our guests and topics. You can also submit your questions for our experts if you have any there. We'd love to be able to ask those on the air for you. So definitely send us your questions or ideas. You can uh, leave it on the website there, or you can email us at fiskpodcast at colorado.edu. And as always, our podcast is available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Make sure to subscribe and like and leave us some comments. We don't want you to miss any of our upcoming episodes, so definitely get on that. Otherwise, thanks again for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Oh, before I go, I also want to mention that this podcast is not available for the public without the public, and we would love to have your help in uh, producing some new episodes. 
of course, you probably know the university funding has been cut very, very, very low. So we can only bring you about seven episodes this season so far. But if you'd like to hear more and you'd like to donate to our cause, you can do that on our website as well. Again, www.colorado.edu slash Fisk. We would love your uh, donations there to help us bring you more awesome, cool science content. So thanks again, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.